get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, Today, our sponsor is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today, I'm very excited. We have Jake Atwood, founder of BuzzBuilder. BuzzBuilder is a software that allows sales professionals to automate their cold email outreach. His singular focus is to make it easy for salespeople to pack their pipeline with qualified leads. Who doesn't want that? He shows a warmer approach for prospecting the busy executives besides the dreaded cold calling methods uh, and buzzbuilderpro.com has tools and programs that have been implemented by over 25,000 sales professionals. I think Jake has probably trained more than that with his books and his resources and I also want to thank John Corcoran for introducing us. So Jake, thanks for uh, joining me. Jeremy, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. I'm really excited and you know on one of your sites it says for more than a decade showing sales professionals how to gain access to executives who seem impossible to reach. So I have to hear some ins- some really good stories of who've been some of the impossible to reach people and how have you or one of your clients reached them? Uh, lots of good stories. I've got one of my first actually back when I was just an entry level sales rep yeah. and uh, I was being mentored by the co-founder uh, or co-owner of Buzz of uh, Telemasters, the last company that I worked with. I've been trying to reach this uh, VP of a very large telecom company, and one day one of his reps dropped off some tchotchkes. You know, it was a little. Uh, it was the summertime. It was a little bucket with a little shovel in it that had their logo on it, and somehow that's supposed to be some kind of a prospecting tool, or I guess a reason I should want to buy from them. And so I took that and I put a card with it. And I boxed it up and I shipped it off to him. And in the card it said, this was how your sales rep is prospecting. And I forget the exact verbiage, but the idea was we can either use the shovel inside this box to bury your competition, (laughs) your choice, when you want to talk. And they ended up buying from us and becoming one of our largest customers that year. So it just kind of shows you in sales, sometimes you got to be bold. Do something to stand out from the masses, right? I love that. So (laughs) give me some more. Tell me some more war stories of how you reach some big up, uh, seem like impossible to reach executive. This is an idea that I got actually from uh, a fellow sales pro and uh, I love this, I used it a couple of times. So I was going after a, a company that was selling a lot of um, manufacturer's goods. They're actually selling uh, fireproof doors, a lot of you know uh, man- construction materials and things like that. So yeah. I went to the hardware store and I got this huge 12 inch barn nail And it was all dirty. I had to polish it up. I spray painted it gold. And I sent it off to him with a note attached that said, reaching you is like trying to nail jello to a tree. (laughs) I nailed big enough finally. And so I called to follow up and his his gatekeeper, his admin, answered the phone and said, can I tell him who's calling? I said, yeah, tell him I'm the guy who sent him the nail. And she goes, you're the guy who sent the nail. He's been waiting for your call. And in I go. So, you know, wow. again, do something creative. I like to do the things that a lot of salespeople just are too uh, lazy to do, frankly, because that takes effort. You know, it's not just sending a quick email out. You got to put some thought into it. So yeah. I want to talk about more of your creative stories. And I wa- or I, you know, went through, you have 18 and a half. I, I suggest other people. I think it's on SlideShare. Your 18 and a half surefire ways to reach any decision maker. Uh, presentation. Is that a yeah, slide share? Yeah, slide share. It's also, you can go to buzzbuilderpro.com. There's a whole resources section there. It's all free. Yeah, and there's this one slide. How did you, and I'm curious of how you discovered to send envelopes that look like express mail. I thought that was a really uh, genius idea. It was basically because I didn't want to spend the money on express mail. I remember I there was a stat from a, a direct mail guru that said that people are like something like 20 times more likely to open and read an email or a piece of direct mail that has uh, it's an envelope with 
with the you know the FedEx look on it, right? Yeah. Than a typical envelope that looks like mass mail. So, you know, it's it's twenty bucks a pop to overnight something like that. So I looked up the legalities of this, and the U.S. Postal Service is fine with any envelope you want to send as long as it's actually not a uh, envelope from the U.S. Postal Service that you're sending through, uh, you know, if you, if you use their envelope that says overnight, you got to pay the overnight fees. So I did a Google search, and there's a bunch of companies out there that will sell envelopes that um, right. kind of are a mock-up of the priority mail that you can send for a dollar a piece. Right. And sales letter inside those, ship it off to that decision maker, and it will get open, man. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I love that. So people should check out Buzz Builder Pro. Dot com and there's a resource. It's under the resources section. If yeah, they check it out. Resources section. You know, uh, I think that's also listed in one of the marketing guides that we've yeah, got. Yeah. Yeah. So you have the golden nail. You have you sent out the pail. You sent out express envelopes. What else have you sent out that has been outrageous? You know, not so outrageous, but one of the most successful things we do yeah. is send handwritten thank you notes, hmm. but not to the gate, not to the decision makers, to the gatekeepers. And so hmm. if I'm trying to reach the CEO of a decent sized company, they typically have an executive assistant right. that's at the front gates, right? And so I'll call and I'll have a conversation with him or her, and then I'll follow up with a handwritten thank you note. Thank you for taking the time on the phone with me. I'm sure you get a lot of calls from people trying to gain access to Joe Blow and look forward to earning the opportunity to meet with him. Yeah. And when I follow up, it makes a big difference. You know, you got to follow up. You're not going to mass mail out these thank you cards and right. then expect the phone to ring off the hook. You still got to you follow up. your process. You know, everything requires follow up. But yeah. again, those little things that make a big difference. You know, on that note, Jake, follow up, right? So what's been the longest time that you prospected someone and they finally answered and then maybe bought, maybe didn't buy? A couple of years. A couple of years. So and what did that look like from the beginning to the end? What, what's one of your favorites? Polite stalking. <laughs> That's what I'm going to title this this uh, right. interview, Polite Stalking. You know, there's actually um, the, the Star Tribune in the Twin Cities. I stalked them for quite a while back in my early days. And long story short, we had our first meeting and we walked out of the meeting and I was there with the founder of, of Telemasters at the time. And, you know, this guy could close anything. And he said, you know, this is going to be a hard sale. It's, there, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. I don't know. If I were you, I might just walk away. It's going to be a lot of work. And I just wouldn't give up. And I kept hounding them and hounding them. And what does hounding look like? Well, because you know. Because you, you're a polite, exactly, nice polite. guy. So what do you my, do? My philosophy is always yeah. leave them better than you found them. So I'm always trying to add value however I can. So. Yeah. It was, of course, calls to them. I also did a lot of reconnaissance. I tried speaking to some folks in their team to get a lay of the land, what's working, what's not, bringing them fresh insights, saying, hey, not sure if you're aware that this is what's going on on this side of the organization. You know, how does that compete against what's going on on this side or relate to that and uh, bring them those insights? But then, you know, it, everything has a cycle. We know if we, if I want to plant tomatoes, I, I put a seed in the ground, I've got to nurture it for a certain period of time before yeah. it finally bears fruit. Yeah. And the same goes true for a sales cycle. So I knew this was going to be a longer one. You got to stay on top of it. And again, it was sending the handwritten thank you notes. A couple of those guys got the nail. Um, you know, they go dark on you, right? Halfway through the sales process right. and you got to find ways to get back in. A couple of times I dropped in because they were local. It was a lot of emails. And then finally, you know, it was, it was the right timing, obviously, and uh, it turned to be the largest sale we had closed that year. What so, type of things, just, what were they buying from your company at the time? At that point, it was consulting services. So they purchased for their classified ads division, that an inside sales division, uh, they purchased a training package that actually went on for a couple of years so it was a pretty substantial sale wow. and you know and a 50 to 100 thousand dollar deal in the training world is a pretty substantial size deal typically so, yeah yeah uh -huh. and it's adding value right it is yeah and we showed up we did an initial workshop we and i said all i'm asking for all i'm asking for is an opportunity one opportunity to show that we can bring you results and, and we'll earn the rest that's all i'm asking for us to one workshop one workshop and I, I'm confident, 100% confident that we will have a long-term partnership after that. We did the workshop and halfway through in a lunch break, one of the reps goes back, makes a call using the tactics she had just learned and said, I got a hold of this guy at Kentucky Fried Chicken. I've been trying to reach for six months. And he keeps blowing me off and I just closed him for a $50,000 ad deal. And it was just, you know, boom. So 
Sometimes it's good to get lucky too. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's good timing, but the tactics obviously work. What did what did they do to finally get a hold of the? I mean, they couldn't have overnight or like uh, overnighted a golden nail that quickly. No, it's yeah. you know they used a couple of the gatekeeper tactics, and then they used a tactic that is uh, really hard for a lot of salespeople to wrap their head around. It's called asking for the business. <laughs> And really, they had never asked for anything. They kept saying, do you have any questions? Let me know if I can help with anything. But they weren't asking directly to start working together. They said, Joe, we've been talking for six months. What's it going to take for us to find a way to work together? What's holding you up for moving forward with this here? Let's go. And I said, sure, sounds good. They just asked. (laughs) I love it. So tell me about Telemasters. How did you first get started with Telemasters? Uh, long story short, I moved up here from Colorado, you know, 22 years old. Telemasters is Minnesota. But as, yep, it, uh, Telemasters is Minnesota. Back at that point, it was my uncle running the company. He, it, was, it was basically him and an assistant, and he did a lot of coaching. He had already made a name for himself. And then, you know, I, I called him up one day and I said, I'm working for this big Fortune 500. I hate it. I'm a cog in the wheel. I want to do something that makes a difference. I want to do something of my own. Basically, I want to start my own company and have no clue uh, what to focus on. He said, well, I've got an idea. Come on out. He said, what would you think about coming to work with me? We could uh, build this thing together. And I said, I'm all in. He said, there's only one problem. I can't really afford to pay you. <laughs> so, That's a problem. Yeah, we figured out what it looked like for revenue share and what it looked like for um, – you know, a small salary to begin with. And then we just grew this thing up over the course of uh, several years to about 25 employees. Wow. Um, you know, a nice uh, seven-figure revenue stream. And then uh, at that point, you know, I wanted to launch Buzz Builder, so I spun off from the company. And then the company was sold. And then Buzz Builder was launched uh, about a year or so later. How did your uncle learn the selling methods? Obviously, you learned from him. Yeah, I learned from him. He is a cold calling genius. This guy was a stockbroker back in the 80s. You talk about making dials, like 250, 300 dials a day. Really? And, you know, wow. selling high priced stocks to people, uh, you know, doctors and business owners over the phone that had never met you before. Uh, you know, that takes some moxie, baby. <laughs> so when you decide that you were going to do this, I mean, a lot of people in there are thinking you're doing cold calling. It's. It's not a pleasurable thing, and which we'll get to obviously with Biz Builder, you know, Buzz Builder right. Pro, which is why you Hold probably created this for people that are total psychopaths. I think so. <laughs> so you had the the guts. You just you were fine with it right away, or were you nervous? What was it like initially? So, so I mean, I, and you know, the way it goes is the the first call is always the hardest, right? And before you know it, it gets easier and easier as you just get through it. And you know, having the training made a big difference too, and really. Knowing how to approach people and having a game plan and, and, and having uh, good tactics helps with the nerves. But you got to just do it. You got to just go for it. And then you, you kind of make it as you, up as you go along. Fake it till you make it, like they say. And that's for a lot of business owners, I think. You know, they're in business for the first time and they think they're in the business of their product. You're not in the business of selling or of your product. You're in the business of sales no matter what you are offering. So right. you're, a, you're a CPA and you want to start your own CPA firm. Guess what? Now you're in sales. Yeah. And for a lot of times, that means you've got to find a way to introduce yourself yeah. to strangers, yeah. whether it's cold calling or networking yeah. or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, one of the things I was taught by, by Steve, the founder of, Buzz, of, of uh, Telemasters, was, listen, you think about it. We're programmed in from the time we're this big not to go with strangers, not to talk to strangers, not to say hi to them, to run from strangers because stranger danger, right? And then in sales, we're taught to do what? <laughs> the opposite. <laughs> talk yeah. to strangers. Yeah. And it's no wonder why we have all these fears of approaching people that we don't know. And as soon as you realize that that's all, you know, in your head, yeah. you know, it's, an, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's easy at, at that yeah. point. It's easier. So, Jake, what are some of the big lessons you learned from your uncle throughout the years? Because you worked with them for almost 10 years, right? It's 10 years, yeah. yeah. You know, don't take your eye off the ball. If there's one thing I've learned, success teaches you nada. And there were about three times in my career at Telemasters when we were working on the business and each one of us were selling. We had salespeople as well selling for us, but we were responsible for our revenue stream as well. And on top of that, we're also doing the coaching. So you sell a big program and you get busy with coaching. And while you're over here busy coaching, guess what you're not doing? Right? right. You're not making the calls anymore. Because you convince yourself you're fulfilling on the stuff that, and you're not selling anymore. Right. It's and in, in the world of business as an entrepreneur, it's always feast or famine. You're always busy either delivering, and if you're not delivering, then you gotta go out and find the next program to deliver. 
And so a few times, you know, I went from making my, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 dials a day, and then all of a sudden I get busy, and I'm making 20 or 30, and then it's down to 10 or 12, and then it's down to nothing. And then before you know it, the pipeline dries up, and you go from being on top of the world to all of a sudden it's the stock market crash for you, basically. And you got to pick yourself up and build a business back up, and, you know, so consistency is king. No matter what happens day in, day out, how busy you get, you got to get certain goals and, and milestones met. At the time, Jake, you're making, I mean, if you're making 20, 30, 50, 70 calls a day, where were you finding prospects? I mean, in the, in the good old days, it was everything from the yellow pages to the book of uh, the, the different business guides, the Twin Cities Business Journal. I remember their book of lists, like the Cranes List in Chicago. If you remember that? Yeah, yeah. These days, it's so easy. I can call up a company like Prospect Cloud, who is a data provider I love working with. And in you know a matter of hours or days, they can give me a very targeted list of all the right people, the right companies, the right uh, contact information. And then at that point, it's just a matter of, you know, how do I want to make outreach happen? Email versus cold call versus... Uh, you know, stalking, <laughs> <laughs> sending them a golden nail, putting right, golden. Right. Na- if they well, don't answer your call, yeah. you just put it under their tire in the parking lot. And <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We have ways to make it buy. <laughs> so, what's your method for at, at that time? You get a list from Prospect Cloud, or someone gets a list like that. What do they do with it today? So, our team today has kind of a two to three pronged approach. Really, a three pronged approach. Yeah. The first is we get the list and then we load that into a buzz builder prospecting campaign. That's an yeah. email campaign. So we have a huge success rate with cold emails. Yeah. Now we do a lot of inbound stuff too. We do a lot of content marketing, a lot of uh, things like try to capture opt-in leads from our website. The trouble with that, it's really a long-term strategy. It could take six to 18 months to really see some traction from that. And that's what it took us. So today we get 80 inbound leads a day. Wow. That didn't happen. That's amazing. Like, when I started Buzz Builder, right. Um, so we'd send a cold email out that was a drip. So I'd send four or five drip emails. Then we're making calls in between. And, you know, one of the things we try to do is make really targeted calls. So it really kind of uh, zoned in on the right people at the right time. So our software will tell us things like when somebody goes to our website to check us out. That's a great time to follow up with a call. Hmm. And so we make these follow-up calls rather than making cold calls. And that's kind of the second phase is, is the calling. We find this magical kind of one-two punch between email, call, email, call. And then after four or five or attempts minimum, um, most of our folks, our sales reps are making about eight to ten attempts. That's a kind of an important number for everybody to kind of lock in their head. Yeah. Not, you're not going to get traction with lead gen unless you can make at least eight impressions. That is eight touches. So it might be four emails and four follow-up calls as an example. And then from there, we don't bring them on board. We load them into a nurturing campaign. And that's more of like an ongoing monthly drip. So and that's a whole different ballgame. That's where we'll look at different content. Like a lot of the guides that are up on the website, uh, you know, they really have nothing to do with Buzz Builder. They're just designed to add value. Right. Our, we sell to, which are sales and sales management. Right. We call vendor neutral content. So we load them in. Every month, they get an email with a different guide best practice, industry trend, try to build awareness around, you know, why it's important for them to look at email as a strategy for prospecting. And then eventually we circle back, you know, so we we politely stalk you via email. And then when the timing's right, we circle back and bring you on board. Yeah. Yeah. What is, and I I still, I don't want to skip over Ovation Sales Group. I want to talk about that. But um, for Uh buzzbuilderpro.com, what's a typical buying behavior? Like do I mean do someone like you were saying within this whole um, whether it's inbound looking at your information the content marketing or getting an email from you or getting a call from the team or them calling you what's typical um, do they go to the website two times and then they buy they don't need to talk to you usually or do they need to talk to someone what's what's a typical lot of in our sale it's our biggest competitor is not another product or anything else they're going to buy. It's the status quo. We need to educate people a lot because this whole idea of prospecting automation, cold emailing, it's picking up steam now, but we're real kind of early adopter phase here. Mm -hmm. Like less than 5% of companies have any kind of a sales or marketing automation solution as a small business. So it's, it's still like early on. So we... 
we can't just put out ads and expect people to say, I'm looking for a prospecting automation solution. Let's find something. They don't even know that exists. Right, right. What we're doing is we're trying to point them toward alternatives to cold calling. Yeah. Ways to drive more inbound leads to their inbox. Ways to drive more consistent uh, lead gen, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So, you know, it's a lot of education. Now, our average sales cycle is under a month, and we've worked hard to get it to that stage because we do a lot early on to, again, um, show them proven metrics and proven methodologies that they can follow so that could reinvent the wheel. Right. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, there's a few tools we use if that's what you're aiming for, I no, guess. No, I'm just curious because... I would think someone who gets, I don't know how many, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, companies like Prospect Cloud, but I'm sure people get that and they don't even know what to do with, with oh, the stuff. Yeah, they either do one of two things. They either cold call down the list or they send a one-time email blast off to all the thousands of people and they hope for the best. And neither one works. Right. You want to have a process in between. So you want to take yeah. that big list and you want to segment it based on either industry or location, territories, or either company size. And then you've got targeted campaigns around each one of those different segments that really kind of speaks their language, things like that. And most of our clients, they'll email roughly between 100 and 150 contacts a week. So some do a lot more volume than that, some do less, but that's about the sweet spot. They can manage about 150 prospects a week. Yeah. yeah. So what's the biggest mistakes? You just mentioned two that people make when reaching out. They'll whether it's blasting everyone at once, um, what, what other mistakes do people make? There's a, there's a, there's a lot. <laughs> so some of the more common ones tactically is uh, they have very long copy. You know, I hear a lot of salespeople say, I've got so many great things when I tell them about my product. You know, I got to spell it all out in one email. And it's like this book. Remember that a lot of people right, are going to open your email from their smartphone. And if they're having to scroll 45 times, read their message, it'll be like scroll, scroll, delete. So that's one mistake. We find that actually sh the shorter the email is, I'm talking like two paragraphs, maybe five sentences max, the best results you get, the highest response. Mm -hmm. It almost seems counterintuitive, but the less you say, the, the more response you'll get. The other mistake is they do everything as like a one-off, meaning they'll make one phone call, leave one voicemail, give up, or send one email, make one phone call, give up. The average sales rep makes two attempts to a prospect and then moves on. The average prospect won't even listen to you until the eighth attempt on average. Yeah. So they make two attempts and they go, oh, they're not interested. And they wonder why they never have enough, uh, you know, going on in the pipeline. So, again, you got to make those, those calls. Who's the best type of company to use your, your software? Is there a certain price point like their product has to be or a certain size company? Not necessarily product size. It's really anybody that tells us that they don't have prospects calling them so or prospects walking in their front door. So, you know, retail is not a good market for us because that's more of a consumer based thing. It's really anybody B2B that needs to prospect. So lots of SaaS based companies, lots of software and IT companies that are out there hunting, a lot of payroll companies, a lot of people that sell to HR professionals, uh, a lot of recruiters, uh, medical devices, uh, a lot of logistics and freight brokers. Really. Ideally, anybody, if you've ever had to make a cold call to reach out to somebody, you're going to love our tool. I mean, that's, that's the best audience for us. And I want to talk about uh, Buzz Builder, your favorite case study, someone using it and the results they got. But I, I want to go back to Ovation Sales Group because um, we're missing something in the timeline from Telemasters to Buzz Builder. What sure. was Ovation Sales Group? Ovation Sales Group was basically uh, my consulting uh, company when I... My, when I spun off from uh, Telemasters, I, my uncle and I both decided, you know what, he wants to start a website that's going to do e-learning. I'm going to start a website like Buzz Builder. And while I was building Buzz Builder, that was my cash cow. And so Ovation was really my coaching and uh, keynote business that I did for several years. Mm. And then about five years ago, I didn't fully retire, but I made the shift and I said, you know, it's hard to balance both businesses at once. And at that point, I already had like 7,000 coaching sessions, literally 7,000 one-on-one coaching sessions. And I thought, you know, it's about the right time to retire from coaching, I think. so. 7,000, uh, really? 7,000 one-hour one-on-one coaching sessions. And I've got the battle scars to prove all <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was time. And I, I love the software industry. It has its challenges for sure that I wasn't expecting, though. What about the coaching sessions? What was one of the, your favorite results that you helped someone get through the coaching? My favorite are the folks that they would send me the folks that they'd say, this guy, he won't sell. 
He won't pick the phone up. Um, he's on probation. We've told him this. You is, get the the worst case scenario. <laughs> Give me their top performer, right? Oh, this guy is good. We're not going to spend more money on him. No, I get the guys a lot of times. Not always, but a lot of times, the folks that say this is their last effort. If you can't turn him around, he's fired in six weeks. And so tall order. But those are the fun folks to turn around. And I remember one guy I worked with. You know, I, you kind of have to get into the psychology behind that. You know, there's a lot of reasons why somebody won't pick the phone up and call. What's the the root of that fear? Yeah. And and the guy goes, I, what makes me seem like I'm worthy to call this CEO of a big company? A year ago, I was homeless. I said, well, what do you mean? I was homeless. I got a divorce. I had some mental issues. I went into a homeless shelter and I lived there oh. for a year. And when I wasn't living on the street. And he goes, I was a drug addict. That's why I got divorced. The whole story, right? Jeez. He goes, this company gave me a shot. I don't even know why. And I feel like I'm squandering it. And I'm not that I'm not trying, mm. but I... I just, I'm, it's not working. Did the company know this story or did you just figure out from talking about talking to him? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so most of the time I kept that stuff, 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 stuff confidential. Yeah. Um, you know, there are times when I'd say to him, you should probably let your boss know about this stuff. Yeah. Uh, my allegiance was really to that person. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, the person turned around, they actually became the top sales rep. So what did you tell him? Yeah. Oh, I tell, just don't be so lazy. <laughs> <laughs> So you took the time to figure out the psychology and why they weren't performing or weren't picking up the phone. Yeah, ex- yeah, we focus on that, and a lot of it is, for me, I had to fo- help him focus on the fact that, you know, my grandpa was senior vice president of one of the largest airlines in the world, and he said it best. He said, no matter what your position is at this airline, you still put your pants on one leg at a time. Yeah. And he still made himself approachable. He'd walk through the, the mechanic shop every single day and talk with the guys under the belly of the airplane, you know, working on the maintenance. And so I, I kind of relayed that story. And then a lot of this is, is just baby steps. I said, today we're not going to focus on making a call to the CFO. We're going to focus on leaving a voicemail to a CFO. Right. Next day we're going to talk about, okay, how do you talk to a gatekeeper of a CFO or a CEO? And baby steps, you know, and the confidence comes over time. It doesn't happen overnight. And so what yeah. happened? He became the highest performer? He became the number one rep in the company. It's a high tech company. He became the number one rep, highest performer, making like a half million dollars a year. Um, wow. It's crazy. Yeah. It just, you, had to, you had to fuel the fire, you know? That's Definitely amazing. Steps. Yeah. It was fun. It was, it, it's, a good, it's a good ride. I still take on some pet projects here and there from some clients that I just uh, love working with. But, uh, you know, and we try to infuse that same culture and buzz builder. We have what we call a coaching culture. No matter how good you are, we can all get better. We can all learn from one another. Yeah. So every couple of weeks we have a coaching call where we each bring in a call we've recorded or a demo we've recorded and we share it and we give each other feedback and insights and, and have fun beating each other up a little bit and, and being positive as well and, uh, and kind of helping each other, you know, be uplifted. So, you know, sales is tough, man. It's, you know, it's highs and lows. So what point do you decide, I need to create a software? <clears throat> well, I didn't decide that. I was first looking for something that I could resell. So uh, the goal with Ovation Sales Group was to sell a group of products. So about that, at that point, I was reselling a recruiting product. Um, I was reselling the Telemasters uh, coaching product and coaching on that. And I wanted to resell some kind of a software platform. So I did this search for two years between 2006 and 2008, and I thought there's got to be some kind of a platform out there that manages all the email, all the follow-ups, that tracks all this stuff, and that tells them, here, you know, who's who to call today? Because otherwise, it's just hunt and peck through your CRM. Yeah. Is that what you did before? What, what, what did it look like before um, you had BuzzBuilder? It was so manual. We literally had people tracking their calls on a tracking sheet. Just You make a call. Yeah. Mark an X. You make an appointment, mark an X. And then we transitioned to software with like Excel and now it's built in a buzz builder, that kind of stuff. And then before that, it was call sheets. I would, uh, you know, print out a list of calls to make that day. You cross somebody off the list if you make a call. And then we open up a database as well. We had an early version of FileMaker Pro for the Macintosh. And so I'd load all my contacts in there. I'd scour the, the, you know, the yellow pages back in the day. And, oh, this person's got a full page ad. They must have money. <laughs> and then when it transitioned to a company like Prospect Cloud and Lead List, now you know, we've got databases we store that in. But databases still don't do a very good job at helping you prioritize your calls you should be making. You know? and it's, it's kind of random. And so we try to take the randomness out of it and say, hey, we're going to give you a list based on the prospects that are most interested in, interested in talking to you today. And that's really 
the birth of Buzz Builder. So you couldn't find anything to resell? No, I couldn't find anything. So I thought, you know, maybe this is an open market. And my first goal was just to find a tool for myself that I could use. So while I was consulting, I could still have a tool out there doing emailing and nurturing for me to keep my, my voice out there and keep my content out there and my pipeline alive. And, uh, you know, so I, I hired this kid who was like 19 years old, living with his mom still in the basement. And uh, he was my first developer. And the kid was like a savant. He'd been his developing. Name was Mark Zuckerberg. What, exactly. You know, um, he'd been developing since like 11. How did you find him? I found him through a, a site called freelancer.com. Oh, okay. And I didn't even know enough about IT to interview anybody. I just found the guy that looked like he had his experience in the right place and hoped for the best. And I got lucky. Um, and so it, it was great. I'd, I'd call up to have a development meeting and his mom would answer the phone. Peter, phone! <laughs> and so, you know, we were big time back then, man. <laughs> <laughs> so where'd you start when creating it? So the first goal was simply to do one thing and one thing. Well, two things. One is send out a drip series of emails. And two, track if people were actually opening them and reading them. And that way I could follow up. And so what I would do is when I'd land a big project, I'd load in all the prospects I was talking to currently. I'd queue up like six or eight different emails to send out as follow-ups to them. And then I would just click go. And over the next month or two while I was working on this project, it would just keep my stuff in front of them. And then... The first client I had was a couple of months in, a large payroll company in town here. I emailed them about doing a workshop toward your end to help them capture your end revenue. Well, I didn't email it. BuzzBuilder did. And so she bought, and the local sales manager flew me down to Kansas City to do the workshop. And she said, the reason we're here is because Jake was so relentless at follow-up. You know, he was on it. He said, I'll, I'll email you again in a week if I don't hear back. And he did. And I, I said, well, I've got an admission. I didn't do any of that. And I explained what the, the tool is all about. And she said, can we buy that? <laughs> and I said, okay, sure. And so they pretty much helped us beta test it and uh, provide the revenue to fuel the, uh, the build out. Wow. Yeah. So what was the learning curve like? Because it still sounds like, okay, you get lucky, you hire like an amazing person. Most yeah. people do not have that. Um, they go through many developers and it doesn't work properly. What was the learning curve for you in that process of wanting to do it and getting it up and running? Yeah, the, the term Wild West really comes to mind, <laughs> to mind. You know, the initial phases, it was, let's come up with an idea and let's just develop it and let's hope they want to use it. And it was no, let's query the customer base. And early on, my... If I could do it all over again, I would have found somebody that could have partnered with me to be my CTO and, and be a founder in the business. That would have saved me a lot of headaches, let's just say. You know, I've always been good at revenue generation, so I kept the revenue coming in, but you also have to really have a good product in the back end. Yeah. And we had, early on the first year, we had a lot of issues. We had, you know, issues with um, busting at the seams. The first uh, guy, Peter, that built it, well, he built it to, to take us to uh, a few hundred users. And right away, we get to a few thousand, and all of a sudden, the thing is just breaking because it's not, it's, it's not scalable. Mm. So I hire another developer, and he comes in, and he clickety-clacks and says, okay, now we're scaled up to you know, a few thousand people. <laughs> and so uh, now we've got, you know, about a, a three years ago, I hired a CTO, and he's really kind of taken us to the next level. And, you know, that's where you find people early on in business that have talents that you don't have and find a way to bring them on board. Yep. So what's a differentiating, some of the differentiating features in Buzz Builder Pro compared to you know, something like MailChimp or something yeah. like that? The biggest feature is that we're just better. <laughs> so, well, obviously. Really, yeah. There's, there's but I could see people ants. thinking that, hey, well, right. why don't I just use something the like main, that? Right. And there's, a, there's like a thousand plus email marketing tools out there. Yeah. We don't really brand ourselves as, as email marketing. We brand ourselves as cold emailing. The difference is MailChimp, all of these will let you email somebody who's gone to your website, filled out a form, and what's called opted into your content. And they'll deliver those emails for you because those yeah. are easy to, to deliver. What's hard to deliver is a list you bought from a list vendor that you load in that then you cold email to and basically prospect to. And we now remain as the only solution out there that will actually deliver cold emails for you from right. our servers. And wow. so we've carved out a nice niche for ourselves. And it has nothing to do with can spam. You're still can spam compliant. It's just it's really, really tough to deliver cold emails. And it takes a ton of resources on our end to make sure that happens. And yeah. no one else wants to deal with it. So 
you know, <laughs> got a nice niche. Yeah. So where are some places? So do these places like Prospect Cloud and Lead List mm-hmm. recommend your services? They do. And if not, we're cold calling them right now to make sure no. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we actually found Prospect Cloud. I'm always looking for good partners in in this business, and okay. we refer. I may of, have, I may have some actually. Yeah, that you're saying it. yeah. Um, we found them because we were referring business to a couple other vendors that were good but not great, and then one of our clients, a couple of our clients, their numbers were just off the charts. And we're like, how can they have this good of an open rate and this low of a bounce rate? You right. know, are they manually like? building these lists themselves using a call center or something. And we found that it was this company prospect cloud. So I called them up and uh, yeah, it's been a match made in heaven. And it's, it's hard to find really good partners where there's that reciprocal relationship. It's kind of like you find, you, you know, you talk to 20 companies before you find one that actually will uh, pony up and, and, and uphold into the bargain. Why wouldn't they though? Because it's just people probably buying more stuff from them. If the lists work, which I would assume your software would make them work better. Yeah, I mean, I mean what's the some, what's their objection to recommending for, your software? There, well, Prospect Cloud has no objection. It's yeah. really there's no company that has an objection to it. But there's a lot of people that let's just say uh, they talk a big game, but when it comes to action, promoting it, there's no follow through. Yeah, and we have a lot of very very good partners. But for example, we took our partner channel uh, two years in from forty partners down to four. We just got rid of the dead wood. There's a lot of companies that, hey, they'll take any leads you send their way, but um, they're not going to help promote you. They're not going to send leads your way. And frankly, that's not what we look for with all our partners either. There's some partners that I'll never get a lead from them, and I don't expect that, but I know they can help our clients and do right by, by them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the end of the day, what I care about most is making sure the customers have what they need to get the results they're looking for. That's what yeah. we're doing by. Yeah. Yeah. Who are some partners that people should, should look at that are good resources? Well, obviously, Prospect Cloud's a good one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, there's a couple local folks in town here that uh, when clients tell us, so we'll do website tracking, and uh, clients will tell us, well, I'm embarrassed to drive people to our website to even track that because our site is so awful. So there's a couple companies, one of which is a company called Geek with a Personality, hmm. and they do a good job building a really uh, good yet inexpensive website for our small business customers mm-hmm. in the Twin Cities here. Uh, and then there's a number of others. We're going to be putting a, a, a list of partners actually on our website pretty soon, so you guys can check back on that. Nice. Yeah. So what's your favorite success story of someone using Buzz Builder? Mm. There's a lot, but I think one of the favorite is the one of the first clients we landed. It was another payroll company. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there are certain industries that are really old school, um, and payroll can be kind of one of those. You know, we cold call. And we work with GPAs, we work for referrals, and that's how we sell. And so it was really kind of twisting your arm, especially with their marketing department, to get them to do something different. So he said, hey, let's just, all we're going to do is, is take some of the marketing content you've got, we'll repurpose it, we'll, we'll buzz builderize it, and we'll plug it into a four email drip. And then we'll have your reps make calls in tandem with that. And within like the first month, they saw over a 600% increase in appointments. Wow. And it was just, it was huge. Were and they it, loading up their previous um, people or how did they get the people that's to load up? That's the exciting part. I didn't even think about that. They only have about 200 or so prospects in their database they go after. So they just keep churning the same prospects oh, really? over. So these are prospects that have been blowing them off already for months, even years. And they still got 600%. So some people went from one appointment a week to six. Some went from two to over 12 a week. Hmm. And uh, so those are fun when, you know, the other success stories, which happen a lot, too, is there'll be a company with 20 reps and they say, you know what, Um, I know only two reps are going to want to use this. The other 18, there's no way ever, ever they're going to use it. And so we go, okay, let's roll this out with the first two reps and see what happens. And inevitably, the first two reps use it and they're just killing it. And then four or five reps go, hey, what's going on over there? You know, can I check that out? And then they jump on board. And before you know it, even like the... uh, the folks that are kind of like, I would never dream of changing my ways, they'll even usually jump on board. The results, That's- yeah, once they oh, yeah. see someone else getting results. You know, the old competitive spirit kicks in, right? So obviously you've become, um, or, yeah, become a master of doing cold emailing um, because that's what BuzzBuilder is built on. What are some, maybe not successful cold email templates, but some elements yeah. that you make sure people include? 
And, you know, we're very uh, forthcoming about our secret sauce. So we like to share the wealth. So if you guys go to the Buzz Builder Pro website, you can download email templates, cold email guides. It's all free. And some of them we've come up with. Some of them we've done in, co in collaboration with cold email experts like one guy named Brian Kruzberger. Yeah. They should yeah. check out. I have a, yeah. a interview yeah. with Brian, uh, and he talks about some of his methods also. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and there's a book called The Power to Get In by Michael Boylan that's about 20 years old, but all the principles are still hmm. totally relevant. I'll check that in. I'll check that yeah. out. Okay. Power to Get so, In. And Exactly. He yeah. talks a lot about some of the uh, strategies that Kreuzberger uses where you're going to be emailing multiple people in the same account, and you're going to be then referencing the other people you're also emailing. So... Um, hey, Jeremy, I'm, I'm sending an email to you, your CEO, Bob Smith, and your VP of whatever, you know, Mary Williams. Uh, let's see who should be involved in the next conversation, that kind of an approach. Um, as far as messaging best practices, the first one is, I see this happen so many times, stop selling in the subject line. They'll put the subject mm -hmm. line as, reduce payroll costs now, improve efficiencies, um, you know, um, a, a better way to blank. Save that stuff for the pitch. The subject line is only designed to do one thing, and that is get them to open the email. Right. So um, if you make a pitch, it just seems like spam. So instead, use a teaser. It could be something as simple as quick question or appropriate person. That's the uh, Brian yeah. Kersberger. Exactly. Yeah. One there. He, it's, it's a lot of success, too. Uh, you know, LinkedIn introdu introduction. If you saw them on LinkedIn and you're following up, LinkedIn introduction right now has a 48% open rate with our clients. Wow. It's by far one of the most successful. What is that? Someone else introducing you to them or what is that? It's you make an introduction from you seeing them on LinkedIn. Oh, it's, I see. There's tools, for example, one, uh, it's a Chrome plugin called Email Hunter. So you go on LinkedIn and even if you don't purchase their in-mails and all that stuff, Email Hunter will find you the email address for anybody on LinkedIn whose profile you're viewing. And it's about 70% accurate usually. But it's better than nothing, right? And so then you email them saying, hey, came across your profile on LinkedIn, thought that it would make sense for us to connect, you know, based on what I saw you yeah. doing. Yeah. This is golden, Jake. This is golden. I love this. <laughs> yeah. We've tried everything, man. You know, we like to practice what we preach. And, uh, you know, our, our reps, some of the best campaigns that have been written have been written by our team. Like one of my reps, Jamie McGuire, he's like our resident cold email guy. He's been here for three years as a sales rep, and he's written some of our best uh, email campaigns. We're just we're testing everything all the time. Hey, let's see if we change this subject line. What happens? Or capitalize this word in the subject line and see what happens. Where can people find that on your site? I'm looking at buzzbuilderpro.com. Um, where one is, there's one called. Um, do they go on? Re, do they click on resources or where do they go? Resources. Resources. Okay. Start with email. I see it. There's cold, cold email, email templates. Yeah, under resources. Right in there. Yeah, that's awesome. That looks great. That's. Ten years of research in five pages or less. There you go. <laughs> That's what should be the headline instead of free tools and resources. It should be ten years of research in five headlines. That's, That's a good idea. That man. should be the new headline. Um, subject lines. Any other good subject lines you like? Um, you know, Brian likes the appropriate person question well, mark one. One of our clients lately had really great success with the subject line of uh, company name results. So. I'd go after Inspired Insider Results would be the, the name. Buzz and Builder. did you do any punctuation after that or no? None. No. no. Okay. And I wouldn't put like an exclamation point or something like that after that either. Uh, and again, that's where in our tool you can actually have the subject line include the name of their company or the name of the people you're also emailing. Another version, if you are doing the uh, Kreuzberger approach right. – from his breakthrough email program, you can actually put in the names of the other two or three people you're also emailing. So it could be call with you, comma, Joe Williams, comma, and Mary Smith. Mm. And that goes in the subject line. We find that works really well too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you decide on pricing when you were doing the software, when you're creating the software? We like to price as much <laughs> as possible. No. We actually. <laughs> We try. <laughs> I had a client of mine that said, here's how you price. You just charge, you keep charging more and more until they complain about the price. And then you know you arrived at the right price. <laughs> you know, we could charge more. Frankly, we're, this is kind of funny, but we, we show the tool to people and then we go to the pricing page of the website. And so often the feedback we get is, that's all? Like they're expecting it to be, you know, $5,000 or $3,000 and they see it's $250 to use the tool and they go, what? But our goal right now is to 
in, in, impact as many people as we can. And, you know, our, our margins still work at that price point. Yes, the prices will go up in the future. They already have gone up five times in the last really? five Really? So how did they, where did you start? $19 a person per month. Now it's $75 per person per month. And so, again, we've got competitors charging 150 um, for marketing automation tools per person. You, you've got some marketing automation tools that are obviously designed to be more robust than ours for marketers, not just salespeople, that are four or $5,000 a month. But we really decided if we're going to go after the small business market who are so underserved, nobody cares about them, it seems like, in this industry right now, then we should make this a price point that's a no-brainer for them. So, so what made you increase it, though, the price? Well, you know, there's obviously as you grow the company, you've got to grow revenues too. So as I hire people, now it's not just me selling this with one person. So part of this was just out of necessity to make the numbers Yeah, work. I just am curious because yeah. it seems like it takes a lot of infrastructure, not just mm -hmm. people, but um, if you're you now servers or whatever goes on to run it. It takes a lot of infrastructure. It's almost like running a manufacturing company. You've got all these cost of goods and you've got all these hard costs and and we're not inventorying product, but we are inventorying servers, for example. Yeah. If there's a ton of overhead you don't have in the consulting world. In the consulting world, I sell the deal, I get paid, and then if I need resources to complete the project, I just go get those resources as contractors, and you know I've already got the money in the bank. But um, with software, it's kind of like you build it and they will come, hopefully, you know, or you hope they do it. So, so how did you get, so I saw you got the first customer, the Kansas City one. How mm -hmm. did you then get future customers? What was another customer that you were? So the first year was really all word of mouth. I didn't have even a sales rep on staff mm -hmm. until year three. And we kind of looked at the first three years as beta mode. And during yeah. this time, I was still running Ovation. That was kind of making the, uh, the majority of the, the income. And then, uh, you know, once we saw Buzzbuild to take off, purely through word of mouth, um, you know, the first quarter million dollars we generated in revenue was purely word of mouth. And from there then, we said, okay, Time to ramp it up and they hired a sales rep and then another and another. And we went from two employees to 12 in like a year. Wow. Yeah. And that's perfect for you because you could train these sales reps. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You so, plug them into the telemaster system. That's what we did. The first person I hired was really only in sales for about six months out of college. He had never done demos before, he, but he had proven to have the work ethic. You know, I've always, I've always th said that I can teach people everything except how to be a good worker, how to work hard. Yeah. I can't. I can't pull you up the mountain or force you to take the first step. I can't push you. So, um, and I don't want to have to push people along every step of the way. So I hired a guy that was just an animal. He was a hunter, <laughs> as a matter of fact. So, How do you identify someone like that in your hiring process? Of interviewing and assessments. Yeah. So I, I still advise everybody uses an assessment tool or multiple. What so do we, you use? Yeah. Um, there's one called... Um, uh, there's one called Objective Management Group. That's a sales-specific one. Hmm. There's one called um, Personality Profiles. I don't use it anymore. It's a disk type like of a, a disk type of thing. Situation, you know, the driver. There's actually a really cool tool we just started using for not just recruiting, but also for um, uh, really understanding the prospects we're meeting with called Crystal Knows. Hmm. And it's $19 a month. You type in the name of anybody, and based on all of the communications they've got out there on LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook and blogs and you name it, it identifies their writing style, the topics they talk about, even how other people are talking about them. And then it gives you their disk profile, which is like scary accurate. I'm wow. sure it's something the NSA has been using for like 20 years, you know. Um, That's but, crazy. You know, there are certain profiles that highly successful salespeople tend to have. You know, they're drivers, they're competitive, that kind of a thing. And they'll give you that insight. And so, like, I just did a pro uh, project where we scoured the Minneapolis market for about 500 salespeople that fit our profile. We ran them through the Crystal um, tool and broke it down to about 50 people that actually have the personality profile to be successful. Wow. In position. So, yeah. It's amazing. It's easy, How did you even hear about that? I heard about it through, um, I was on a website and I was looking at their integrations on what systems they integrate with. And one of the th things they integrated with was Crystal Nose. And I go, what the heck is that? I thought I knew like all the apps out there. So I Googled it and then I found out what it was. And I'm like, that's really cool. And of course, oh. you do a vanity search first, right? You look up yourself. And like, <laughs> What did it show for you, by the way? Um, <laughs> oh, it said... It said, Jake is a visionary, he's creative, he's personal, <laughs> and he is super impatient. And I'm like, speed to a team. Super impatient, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, if it said all those positives, I would send that to your wife and be like, how accurate is this? And she would, 
Just exactly. put a pin in your big head. Well, it's funny. My wife and I have almost, have almost the identical profile. And you'd think, oh, that's perfect. It's a match made in heaven. But it's like we're both impatient. We both don't plan. So like when there's a vacation going to happen, we're looking at each other going, okay, who's going to book the tickets? <laughs> I don't have the patience for that. Uh, too good. Colby, any thoughts? Do you ever use Colby? Yeah, we've used Colby. Actually, I hire – Colby I use more for my support staff because I want to find folks that are the exact opposite of me and of the sales team that are going to basically plug our gaps. And so, um, yeah, I use the Colby – I think it's a Colby A or e, the B index. Okay. It's, it's cheap. It's like 75 bucks. Yeah. I love it. Thanks for sharing that, Jake. Huh? Um, so challenges throughout, even though you're, I mean, sales cures all, I'm sure, in your world, but what are some so of the my challenges? challenges were like yeah. self-imposed challenges. You yeah. know, um, my biggest weakness has always been, I'm like a lot of entrepreneurs where I'm like this rugged individualist, right? I can do a lot of things. I can build my website. I can sell. I can help design the product. I can manage customer support, I can create operations, and I can manage the finances and do bookkeeping. And, you know, I can do that stuff, but not all well. And I can't give my total focus to all of it. So the business didn't really start to take off like a hockey stick until I got somebody to manage the bookkeeping, somebody to manage the support, somebody to take over all the marketing. Even yeah. though I love marketing, that's time consuming. It's like, okay, I either want to um, manage and grow the sales team and those efforts, and think about the vision of the company or yeah. work on ebooks. And so I hired my first marketing person, actually, was uh, a group of unpaid interns. So How did Craig, you get that? At Craigslist. Uh, I said, you know, you'll do more than just fetch coffee at this position. We'll teach you the real life tactics of marketing you don't learn in college. We won't pay you, but you'll get a <laughs> <laughs> education and you'll get paid when you get hired. And actually, we had a program where we put them in touch with clients and the first three interns, we helped them get hired by some large agencies. They made some good money and, it, and so it paid off for them and then it kind of took off from there. So I've had about a dozen unpaid interns mm. over the last uh, few years. Yeah, You're a big <laughs> software and apps person. What software and apps do you use either to run the business or personally? So uh, to run the business, we use Pipedrive and Salesforce jointly as CRM. Uh, we're using Crystal Nose. We use a tool called Charlie, which is really cool for helping do kind of research on customers and prospects we're going to meet with. It gives us a breakdown of all the, it kind of aggregates all the newsworthy things about them right down to their interests. I just had a call yesterday um, with a, a, a client and it said she follows and loves the show, um, The Mindy Project. And so guess how we kicked off the conversation, you know? I'm like, I've watched the Mindy Project here. And then before that, um, there's a guy in Chicago that it said was a Broncos fanatic. Well, it turned out he went to school at University of uh, Colorado, CU, and he's friends with John Elway. Wow. So it's, it's, it's kind of cool kind of science. Um, you know, other ones, I love a tool for Google. We use the whole Google suite. It's called Streak. There's another one like it called Boomerang. And it basically helps you keep track of all your follow-ups. And so yeah. if you email somebody, you want to know, hey, if they don't email back in two days, remind me to follow up with them. Yeah. It's a pain in the butt, though, to go into your CRM and schedule a task and schedule a follow-up reminder. Here, you just make a checkbox that says, hey, they don't respond back in two days, ping me. So it's, it's a nice way to yeah. keep up yeah. kind of stuff. And then um, my favorite tool is this one called Buzz Builder. <laughs> Buzz Builder Pro. So... <laughs> Yes, that is, I'm sure, your favorite, your favorite tool. But, uh, yeah, beyond that, you know, there's a lot of other apps on my smartphone I use uh, for project management, things like that. They're more boring. Nothing as fun as, like, uh, Crystal. That's my latest. Anything else with, uh, like, personally you use for productivity because you're married, you have two kids, you're running a big company. What do you do I for productivity? I use Google Suite big time. My wife and I have a shared calendar set up that everything goes on. Write down a dentist appointments. I've downloaded my entire hard drive onto Google Drive, and so every single document is hosted on Google Drive, not on my laptop. Mm -hmm. And it syncs, of course, so there's no more hassling with that. Um, I actually check all my email from my iPad. I went out and I bought an iPad Pro, the big, the big one. Is that new? It's it's new. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, but I bought it about three months ago. And I use it for two things. One is for scribbling ideas. I, I still find I can brainstorm better with the pen in my hand. So I bought the stylus for the, the iPad and mm. I can scribble out. And then I dictate every one of my emails. Really? Yep. So, what do you use? Just 
the iPad has it built in. You click on, on you, from email, you click on the microphone, wow. and you can dictate, and it does voice-to-text recognition. And I can answer emails like five times faster than, you know, clickety clack wow. them out. So is there that feature on the desktop or no? So there is kind of, but it's clunky, and it works better on the iPad. And it's just, you know, that's, that's my MO. I, I have two screens, but they're not two monitors. There's a laptop, and next to it's my iPad. Yeah. Yep. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It's for me. So did you learn copywriting and direct response from anyone in particular or read any books? Because it seems uh, like you are very well versed in... Lots of books. I've, I've always had the philosophy. This is from a guy named Jim Rohn who is, uh, you know, like a business philosopher, if you would. He said, the books you don't read won't help you. Yeah. So I've read hundreds, perhaps thousands. Who are your favorites, uh, copywriting, direct response? Um, you know, my favorite book actually on copywriting yeah. has nothing to do with copywriting itself. It's a book by a guy named Robert uh, Cialdini mm. called Influence. Yeah. He's a social psychologist. And he yeah. basically answers the question, what motivates somebody to do something, to take action? Yeah. Um, how do you persuade people? And it's the best book on marketing, sales, and copywriting yeah. I've come across. Yeah. Um, yeah. He just came out with a new one, Persuasive. Did yeah. you check? Did you I get checked? Check no, I haven't read it. Very and good. There, yeah, and there's there's a lot of books out there. Um, you know, there. I, I, I you know I'd say that's probably my my favorite though. So I always ask Jake, um, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask, what's been the lowest point for you, and how you push through, and then yeah. on the flip side, what's been one of the proudest moments? What's lowest, been the lowest point? This is probably about. About four years ago, so I was about uh, two years into Buzz Builder, and it was making some small progress, tick, 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 but it was like, you know, one step up, two steps back, it always felt like, and I was just discouraged by, you know, of course, you have these big dreams, like, okay, first six months, I'm going to open up, you know, 10,000 users, and, you know, it's going to be a billion-dollar company in 10 years. (laughs) Of course, you're always a bit unrealistic there, so I sent some benchmarks, but... You know, the product was having a hard time because of development issues, and it was just, you know, all, it was just not making it happen. And I knew I could go to work for another company if I wanted to and be a VP of sales or even take over as an interim CEO and make a lot more money. And I'm like, this is the debate, of course, right? Do I live the dream or, or go for the payday? Yeah. Of course, you know, my wife and I had a lot of heart to heart conversations like, you know, and the business is taking so much time. Um, you know, I got a family to support here, I got a, a nice mortgage going on. And so I, I basically made the decision, all right, I'm going to give this six months. Hmm. And you're just going to take off to the moon in six months, and I'm all in. It's a short window. I'm done. It's a short window. Yeah. But I, I needed to give myself some urgency, I thought. you know, yeah. That's tough in, when you run a business because who's holding you accountable is the owner. Yeah. So yeah. I thought, you know, what's going to hold me accountable is I, I tell my friends, I tell my family, I got to bring this to this level in six months. And now they're watching. And now I, it kind of plants a seed in the back of your head too, doesn't it? And uh, we got there in four months. You know, wow. we got the goals and, um, you know, things. Was your going. goal like a user goal or was it revenue goal or what? what it was were you- mainly based on revenue from, from account acquisition. So, you know, I went out and I just pounded the pavement and I did some lead gen tactics to bring on business. And, you know, we got lucky a couple of times. But of course, I find the harder I work, the luckier I seem to get. Right. So, it works out that way. You know, yeah. It works out that way. And, you know, so, you know, and what inspired me is right about a month into that, I'm just going, you know, is it even worth six months? And I go to this event in town here, and there's a cooperative uh, office complex in town here called Coco. They've got a few locations, and they, they had an event, they had a startup event for startup software companies. And they brought on some really talented, really successful entrepreneurs that had already grown their businesses to 10, 20, 100 million dollars. Yeah. And they all told their story about how they started out. And there's a guy in town here that said, you know, I was living on my buddy's couch for six months by night and then coding by day. And it seemed like the product would never go anywhere. And now he's at 30 million dollars in revenue. The guy's got like a five million dollar house out of Minnetonka. Wow. And they all seem to have the same uh, common denominator is nobody ever got there the easy way. Yeah. Because I guess if it's easy, everybody would do it. And so did he share how he got from the couch to $30 million? Or? You know, just never give up, man. Yeah. And it was, it was let's just keep focused on the vision. Yeah. I, I, and, it, and, it, and it works, you know. And you can't take your eye off the ball. You got to just keep believing. So a month in when you heard that, 
yeah. Jake, were you like, well, maybe I'll give it seven months. Were you still like, nope, six months, that's it? The fire. Well, because I thought because I'm having these problems that something's wrong with the business, something's wrong with me. Maybe I wasn't, didn't have what it took. Maybe the product just, you know, wasn't, wasn't uh, you know, good enough. Yeah. Uh, but there's a million other variables that come into play. I mean, we all look at the guy that goes, he is so lucky. How did he make a million dollars? Because he doesn't know what he's doing. His product's not even that great. He's just gotten lucky. But what I've learned through the years is the guy wasn't lucky. Now, he wasn't the brightest bulb on the tree, but he just didn't know how to give up. And actually, it's funny because I remember talking to a guy I met who was worth like $20 million, $30 million. And I remember thinking, this guy has got to be one of the most, like, the biggest idiots I've ever met. Like, he can barely put two sentences together. He didn't even graduate high school. How is it possible he's successful? I'm like, he had to have inherited the money. The money. Maybe it's a trust fund. Maybe it's his dad sort of the business. Turned out, his biggest blessing was the fact that he didn't know how to do much of anything at all except go out and sell and build relationships. So he was automatically forced to find the right people to do all the things that he didn't have a clue how to do. Mm. He didn't have any option. He had to find people to do that, and they could do it way better than he could. Mm. And meanwhile, here's Jake, you know, the rugged individualist. And I'm doing everything because I think I can. And meanwhile, I'm the idiot, <laughs> you know? So four months in is when you hit that goal. Yeah, about four months in, we really started to hit our stride. We had our first like big breakthrough month in revenue. And back then, that was like we hit you know thirty thousand dollars in revenue. Now we're losing money at thirty thousand dollars. It puts things in perspective. But that at that point was kind of like life changing money that yeah. now I can, go out and I can hire a sales rep and I can uh, I can afford to hire a, a third developer. I can afford to have some breathing room and have some cash in the bank. I'm not working on four hours of cash flow, you know. <laughs> Four hours. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta close the deal by the end of the day, otherwise this thing's folded up. <laughs> so, so what about the proudest moment for you? Oh man, um, you know I I do a bad job of celebrating the wins. I'd say the proudest moment has just been yeah. when we brought on Jamie and we put a process in place that helped him be successful. And then he made a lot more money that year than he thought he'd make. And, and then he made in his last job. It's like, okay, we've got something here now, you know? Um, what about lately? What's been a, um, a milestone or proud moment lately? For you the know, company? if you want to go to the standard stuff, you know, revenue, we had our biggest quarter ever a couple quarters ago. Wow. And so that we never even expected. I mean, things just all kind of popped, which is, again, if you're managing the pipeline, it'll eventually happen. So, that was huge. Um, we finished the biggest upgrade to the software we've ever had. So about a year and a half ago, again, we're busting at the seams. I hire this consultant to come in um, along with my CTO and, and basically help us figure out, do we just try to um, patch and band-aid our existing software and keep it, you know, you know, keep bandaging it? Or do we just start from scratch? And it made more sense to start from scratch. So we started from the ground up. We rebuilt the software. And we thought it was going to take six months. <laughs> it took a year and a half. I was going to say three years. <laughs> and, and three times as much as I thought it was going to cost. Yeah. So did you have to bring on other help outside the CTO? Or yeah. To, so he actually enlisted the help of a development firm that he manages. And he, uh, he, uh, he, he's hired some of the folks within that to build the software. But now it's taken our software to this real elite level. Yeah. Uh, and I love building things. I mean, from the time I was little, I was always the guy that was, I get a new toy and I would take it apart so I could kind of put it, figure out how to put it back together again. So software to me is fun because I like to build software. I like to see an idea, kind of a dream, uh, turn into something tangible you can play yeah. with. Um, so launching the new software, that day it was like, for me, Christmas, unpackaging my shiny new software app. Yeah. It was pretty fun. Jake, who do you go to for advice in mentorship now? I'm sure your uncle. Who else? uncle for sure. And, you know, that's where it's, I'd say if anybody is trying to really kind of elevate their business, business next level, find people to work, to talk to that are more successful than you are, whose businesses are better than yeah. yours are bigger. And you're going to learn a lot. You know, you'll learn from their, their mistakes and uh, successes. And, you know, they've been there and done that. Usually they can offer a fresh perspective. So, you know, there, there hasn't been other than, you know, my uncle, and then, of course, family members, any one person I would pinpoint as much as just having groups I plugged myself into. Yeah. Do you have groups um, 
that you do plug yourself into, whether it's a mastermind or you go to a conference, like an industry conference? There's been a lot. So I, what, I, yeah. I attend a lot of conferences, yeah. you know, whether it's a specific one. What do you like? Yeah. Ship. There's a there's a group that, for example, in town here, I'm the board of directors with. Um, I attended and I liked it so much, and it was founded actually by my uncle. It's called Professional Sales Association. Mm-hmm. It's got um, some big hitters in there, some entrepreneurs that are really successful, some CEOs, as well as a lot of um, you know entry level salespeople looking to learn the art uh, of sales. And it's just a great place to go and uh, and brainstorm ideas. There's a couple of fellow software uh, CEOs in there that I'll I'll network with. And ask how things are going, and uh, you know they've got a different perspective than I do. So, Any other industry conferences across the yeah, U.S.? Yeah, you know, um, there's actually a, a couple of small business. Like I'm flying out to L.A. to go to a small business conference out there in mm-hmm. in uh, November, November 10th, and so I try to do a search for a lot of those events coming up and have a chance to just get out there and, and network with fellow CEOs. And a lot of it's being introduced by folks like yourself. Uh, you know, being introduced to fellow CEOs in the neighborhood here. Yeah. Go out and meet with. And it's great because a lot of times they'll just have a totally different skill set than I do. So I'll share some ideas for marketing that they never thought of. And they'll share some ideas for, you know, other aspects of the business that I never thought of. And, you know, you all win. I have one last question, Jake. And this has been awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Everyone should first check out buzzbuilderpro.com. Any other places they should check out online or on your site? That we should point them towards. So, um, the site that I like it's uh, is full disclosure. My uncle started it, but it's by far the best resource for prospecting skills. If hmm. that's what you're looking for, it's yeah. called the prospecting expert dot com. Prospecting so expert dot com. There's another one if if you're more of a a marketer or you're an entrepreneur that wants to learn a lot about marketing. Then there's a really cool site I like called marketingexperiments.com, and hmm. it's all free. They basically do all these big marketing projects for like huge companies, like Wall Street Journal Online, and and these companies. And they publish 100% of the before and after picture with the project. So that's say, amazing. Okay, here is the website, and here's what they're doing to generate leads. And then we fix this, 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 and here's how it worked. And so you learn from everybody else's, uh, you know, budget basically they spent on this. Who runs that, or is it so a big group? It's, it's a big group. They are they're a company called Marketing Experiments, and then uh, you know they've got quite a staff. And then they recently, a couple of years ago, they acquired the largest marketing association called Marketing Sherpa. Hmm. Both groups. So, and they've just got tons of like really good content on oh, there, and they awesome. run it more like a research laboratory. Right. Uh, you know, so you get all the. All the, the metrics and so There's forth. too many good resources here. So everyone should check out buzzbuilderpro.com. And so, Jake, last question is what did we – what should we talk about? What did we not cover with Buzz Builder Pro or cold outreach or whatever you think uh, we need to to finish off with? I think we ca- – I mean, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, you know. I'm not all that interesting of a guy, so I'm not, <laughs> you know, my biggest accomplishment in the personal life is I'm like a champion ping, ping pong player. <laughs> well, well, next time we see each other, I'm going to challenge you. So There we go. Yeah, I, I got two kids that keep me plenty busy. We're having a good time there, you know. Cool. Thank you. And um, any maybe um, type of companies, if people know these type of companies, they should check out uh, BuzzBuilder if they're this listening. Type of companies that would be a good candidate for yeah. BuzzBuilder? Mm-hmm. Really, if, if your reps cold call, they need the tool. If you're seeing less business from referrals and trade shows, you need Buzz Builder. If you're trying to take a team that is, notori- that is like historically not hunted and now you want them to hunt for the first time, you need Buzz Builder. Those are our three main audiences. Right. Yeah. Jake, this is fantastic. Thank you so much. Check out buzzbuilderpro.com. Thanks, Jeremy. All right. Happy hunting. What I got. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand